Hello and welcome to the Unlucky Frog Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Porter, and I'm joined this Independence Day by Frank West of City of Games. How are we doing, Frank? Yeah, I'm very good. Thanks for having me on the show. How are you, Ben? Yeah, I'm, I'm well. Um, this will be take two for this interview. Um, hopefully, hopefully it goes a bit better this time. <laughs> well, as long as we get the sound recorded, we'll be good, right? <laughs> yeah, I will say that that was no fault of Frank's, so... Um, yeah, please, please don't be put off listening to him. He, he's he's a lovely man and has some <laughs> some very interesting things to say about tabletop games. I appreciate the clarification. Then it was it was definitely not my fault. <laughs> it, it was a technical faux pas, but um, yeah, we'll 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 gloss over that. Anyway, Frank, you are a game designer. Um, you are probably most well known for. The City of Kings, but you currently have a new game, Vidoran Gardens, on Kickstarter, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But first of all, um, let, let's get to know Frank West, the man, and we'll start at the beginning with your introduction to tabletop gaming. How, how did you get into tabletop gaming? So, I guess for me, I'm one of these people who, like a lot of people, you know, I played a lot of the kind of the old classics, kind of Monopoly and Cluedo and stuff, kind of growing up. Sure. But when I, I kind of think about this question a lot, because I do get asked about it, and my kind of default answer has always been some of my friends kind of introduced me to modern board gaming. But when I kind of look over the years, you know, when I was at um, secondary school, kind of 15, 16 years ago, um, I used to play a lot of Magic the Gathering, and I was a very, very big fan of kind of Magic the Gathering. And I guess that whilst that's not a modern board game, like in some ways it's kind of all part of that same hobby. And when I kind of think over the years, there's lots of little intakes of different games that I played at different points. But I would say it wasn't until much more recently, you know, kind of five years ago, maybe somewhere around that, where some friends started introducing me to some of the more modern games and I started playing them and loved them and kind of, you know, came home, bought games and ended up very quickly having a huge, huge pile of games in the corner of my room, <laughs> as I think everyone does. And Every so often, Facebook kind of, when I log in, you know, it does those memory posts where it says, like, four years ago, you posted this. And I kind of look at the kind of photos of my games back then and kind of sigh kind of a desperate release of kind of like, you should have stopped buying them. You have too many now. You know, that was enough. <laughs> yeah. So the, g games have always had a bit of a presence in your life, whether you're aware of it not, or not then. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was I was definitely a very big kind of video gamer growing up, and I do enjoy kind of digital games. But, um, you know, another story is my GCSE graphics project. Um, so that was um, probably early 2000, and it literally was a, you need to design a board game. And we had to go off, and for a big part of our course, we had to come up with our own board game and kind of design that. So even then, I guess, there was a big element of kind of, board games and board game design in my life but uh -huh. um i never knew the path it was going to lead me down so academia forced you to design games against your will <laughs> as a man you've been pulled back into it so what what made you want to design games because not everyone that plays tabletop games feels the desire to actually go and make one so for me, originally, it was all about designing video games. Um, when I was at university, I did a course project on designing an AI system for a real-time strategy game, um, and I really enjoyed that. And I kind of met some people online who ran video games, and I used to help them with some development of that. And I really enjoyed that kind of game design process. And for me, I always wanted to create kind of this big kind of immersive gaming experience. And obviously, as a video game, that requires huge amounts of resource and lots and lots of people to kind of do it to the scale I wanted. And I think that I tried it a few times and for one reason or another, it just never really happened. But then as I got into the kind of the tabletop world and board games, I started to kind of 
have there was two paths one path was i wasn't finding the board game that kind of had the experience that i really wanted from kind of my video game days and then the other path of that was i kept like seeing mechanics and going wow this feels like a kind of video game this feels like a video game you know the idea of choosing how long you want to play for what level difficulty you want to play on you know all of these kind of mechanics were just forming and i think there was just a point where i played enough board games to kind of go I could create that video game kind of feel, but in a board game. And I could kind of tick that box of the game that I kind of always wanted to create as a board game. And it just kind of naturally evolved from there. So you've talked a little bit about your experience with video games and how you wanted to to bring elements of that to the tabletop. Um, you. You, your most well-known game, The City of Kings, which is now in the hands of players. Um, we, we've played it um, at Unluck, Unlucky Frog Studios, um, and one of the things that, that I noticed in particular is that The City of Kings borrows a lot of beats from MMOs. Um, things like the, the monsters that you encounter um, require quite a bit of coordination between the players to take down. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's not... Um, a, a dungeon crawler by any means and there's a lot of harvesting of resources that's tied to the progression of your characters but was it a conscious design decision to implement these things into the city of kings yeah completely for me um designing an mmo board game was pretty much the number one goal i i played many many different games kind of growing up but the one i spent the most time on was world of warcraft and for me um there's several aspects of that which i really really wanted to kind of borrow from that kind of the world exploration of not knowing what's going to be around the corner and kind of each time you kind of explore further into the world you encounter new things and then the kind of the dungeon slash raid like combat systems where rather than it just being you know lots of people fighting lots of things it's a team of people fighting against one thing you know you need your tank you need your healer you need your kind of dps your damage dealers and you need to kind of have that tactical positioning and it's something that's kind of it's really interesting in the board game world because if you jump into an MMO and you jump, you get a group of people and you kind of go into a dungeon or you go into a raid, you know, by default, people know that you require these roles. It's kind of the mentality of those type of individuals. But when the kind of the board game world, I found that people were like a lot less experienced and kind of familiar with that kind of idea. So I really wanted to kind of take that and kind of turn it into something that could work in a tabletop form. It is quite interesting you talked a little bit about these different um, character archetypes that are so prevalent in MMOs because um, quite naturally uh, the the three of us when we played the City of Kings adopted the these different um, personas where we had Josh um, he decided right away right okay I'm going to be the healer and I'm going to stay back a bit and try and um, buff you guys and heal you up and keep you in the fight and I adopted a sort of tanky role where I was deliberately getting in the way of the monsters and then Charlotte um, she she was um, she was doing her damage dealing um, so I, I, I think um, I think in terms of integrating those mechanics that's been um, successful for you yeah and it's kind of really interesting because there's definitely like several groups of people you know and there's the people who are familiar with that stuff and just dive in and they know from day one this is how i meant to proceed and they're you know as i said earlier the people who go into an mmo and they go into a dungeon and they know what to expect and they kind of they team up in that way and then you have the other side which is the people who aren't familiar with those concepts and they kind of have to battle against it and the game is designed to um the first few creatures you encounter to try to really push you into those roles by kind of giving you difficulties and problems that really you're best off kind of getting into those roles to solve mm -hmm. but it's it's very interesting to watch different groups and in playtesting there was a huge difference between when i got 
um, you know, I was going to say professional, when I got experienced board gamers to play the game versus when I got experienced kind of video gamers who hadn't really played many board games to play the game. And it was really interesting to see the tabletop guys um, understood the rules and the mechanics so much easier, but they found the strategy much harder, whilst the video gamers got the strategy and they understood what to do, but they obviously found the rules that little bit more challenging. And the whole kind of play testing process was about trying to bring those two kind of sides to a kind of meeting ground in the middle to try and give them both the entry point that they needed. Uh huh. That's, that's quite an interesting exercise and it's quite interesting now actually because for so long we, we've we seen video games borrow beats from tabletop games. I mean that, that that's essentially what an RPG is isn't it? It's, it's people that have grown up playing things like Dungeons and Dragons the Cthulhu RPG, whatever. But now we're seeing more and more that the tabletop is is beginning to borrow from video games. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it definitely works both ways. And, you know, um, Hearthstone is a huge kind of um, video game that, you know, is effectively kind of a Magic the Gathering-y kind of card game, but in digital form. And that, I guess, is a huge example of that done well. But I think that from board games borrowing from video games, there's very much kind of two separate streams. And I think one of those streams is the people who do what I did, where it was kind of, I'm creating a new game, but I want to kind of try and bring some of those mechanics or some of those feels across. And the other group are the people who say, you know, I want to make a XYZ the board game and they take a video game and try and replicate that video game exactly the same as a board game. And I feel like that kind of approach is much more kind of problematic because the relationship between how you play both types of games is different and you have to be able to kind of tweak and change video game mechanics to make them work as a board game. But I think that those people who create a board game but they're trying to borrow some of those mechanics without the constraints of being exactly the same type of game can come up with some really interesting ideas. It's an interesting balancing act, as you say, because with the exception of um, the the co-op games um, and the the multiplayer shooters and uh, the MMOs, generally speaking, a a video game is a very solitary experience, whereas more often than not on the tabletop, people are looking for an interactive experience, aren't they? Completely, and... I mean, it's there's kind of there's two difficulties about it. There's, as you say, it's that kind of community social experience, and I think that's why cooperative games play so well with borrowing those kind of mechanics. And the other element is the concept of kind of real time and things kind of automatically happening. And when you play a video game, there's so much going on in the background with some games that you're just not aware because it's just automated. Whilst when you bring that to a table, you have to find ways to kind of either skip those elements or kind of allow players to automate them without kind of realizing and Mm -hmm. that often results in kind of a poor kind of solo experience as well absolutely moving on to the art style for the city of kings um city of kings has a, a very striking art style um so much so that i think that people that are familiar with the game now could look at a piece of art and probably know right away that it's from the City of Kings. It's familiar in that it's a fantasy universe, but at the same time you you use quite a surreal colour palette and things like um, you've got dwarfs in the universe, but they're more like anthropomorphic mole rats. So for a game as big as the City of Kings, it, approaching the the art style for that must have been quite a daunting prospect. Yeah, I mean, it's... I would say both the art and the kind of writing. I would say the art is obviously the much more kind of known element to it because it's the much more visual element. But both with the artwork and with the kind of the story writing, there's such a kind of heavily involved process that happens behind the game. And this is because for me, the City of Kings isn't 
one game. It's a universe. It's a world that we're kind of building. And um, our artists and our writer who kind of work with me um, on kind of creating this world, those guys aren't so much involved in the game. I mean, obviously, they are aware of the game and they interact with the game and they have ideas for the game. But the kind of the brief really with them is let's grow the world, let's kind of develop the world. And then it's kind of my responsibility to bring that into kind of game form and tell those stories kind of through interactive kind of ways. Mm -hmm. So our artwork, um, we've spent years of working on these kind of characters and creating these kind of identities. And this all starts with a writing process. You know, before we even draw anything, we have loads of research that goes, goes into each character. We kind of, we have this rule set of, you know, what are the kind of two elements, what two animals kind of create this or what kind of evolutionary process happened to produce this being. And then we look at the other characters we've got and we kind of say, well, you know, what color do we want to be the focus of this character? And kind of what makes sense for who they are and the world they come from and we try and create this kind of continuous kind of colorful kind of in-depth storytelling kind of experience through both the art and the writing that kind of exist around the game mm -hmm. so in terms of design philosophy are you talking more about i think last time we spoke i i mentioned that um the the director of the Elder Scrolls series um, is quoted saying that the main character in their games is the world, and that's reflected in the the titles for each iteration in the series, isn't it? Because you've got Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim. They're, they're place yeah. names. Um, what one of the things that that he said in their approach to storytelling is. They'll, they'll place things in the world that you're only really going to find if you're looking for them. So if you're going through a dungeon, you can start to piece together what happened to the prospectors that came there by examining the evidence and things like that. It's not spoon-fed to the audience. Is that something that you wanted to do with the City of Kings, where rather than spoon-feeding a story... You, you sort of have to look under rocks and things like that, as it were. Yeah, there's so many layers to kind of the story that's being told. There's, you know, the base narrative that just runs through the game that everyone who plays is going to read and experience. And then there's kind of a visual narrative that happens with a lot of the artwork. Um, we specifically draw pictures and design scenes to kind of tell stories in their like, their own way. So all of our equipment cards, for instance, are a unique scene with kind of the item. And each of those kind of has a backstory and a name and stuff, which kind of helps just bring the world to life. But as people play through, they'll notice things and experience things. And as we kind of, you know, with Vidoran Gardens about to come out and a few other games we're working on, these are all designed about kind of telling different snippets in time. So with Fedoran Gardens, um, this is it's a very different game to the City of Kings, but it's kind of set in a slightly earlier time frame. Mm -hmm. And in the City of Kings, there's this whole kind of mentality of these kind of creatures came out of nowhere and um, they started kind of attacking and killing things. Whilst in Vidoran Gardens, there's kind of little tablets on the floor that kind of have little messages and symbols on them that kind of imply that actually someone or some things knew about those creatures and they were kind of writing about them and passing messages about them in kind of an earlier period of time than we kind of originally thought. So these kind of games all have these hidden layers that if, you, if you're not interested and you're not familiar, you don't need to know them. But as you play through the game, you might notice them and kind of think, oh, that's kind of related to this or that's related to that. And the kind of the bigger story unfolds. Sure. So the City of Kings has, has shipped, it's with the players. Um, a lot of people have, have had time to, to play it. And presumably you as the creator... Uh, you've had a bit of time to reflect on um, the City of Kings, the creative process and the, the Kickstarter campaign for same. Is there anything that you would have done differently with the City of Kings looking back? I think it's always an interesting question because um, I come from a world of like technology and programming and this kind of evolutionary process of 
if you do something and then you do it again, you should always be able to do it better the second time around. And if you don't, then you might as well not be doing it because if you're not learning and kind of improving, then you know, you're never ever going to be kind of great at what you do. Um, with the City of Kings, there's, there's so many kind of tiny little things that might tweak or change. And I don't think any of them individually kind of really mean anything but they just kind of would help you know tweak things and improve things like the odd word i might change or the odd kind of icon or kind of picture i might change but i think the to kind of be more interesting than that i think the the big element i would change which is kind of i guess the more interesting thing to discuss would be the way we probably marketed the game in the first place because as we kind of said earlier on this kind of um chat um you know it's it's not a dungeon crawl it's about this kind of open world mmo kind of um raiding combat open world exploration resource gathering kind of mmo like experience and i think that we definitely um before we did the first kickstarter could have found a way to further kind of explain to people that it's that kind of experience and not a dungeon crawl type of experience yeah. but when you're doing something that's kind of different to what people have seen before it's always very hard to find a way best way to kind of explain that to them that's it um it's quite an interesting one that isn't it that you you as the designer you you want to innovate as much as you can but at the same time sometimes you, your audience is maybe not quite ready for what you're doing or as you say it's a little bit difficult to distill some ideas down to a, a marketable form especially when it's such a big game with so much in it you know i think that you know if it was a 20 card kind of tiny little box kind of game that just does one simple kind of mechanic or not simple but you know what i mean a much more reduced kind of concept yeah, yeah. um it becomes so easy to kind of break that down into a line and it's one of the things that's really interesting because the city of kings is a huge game whilst fedoran gardens is a tiny game and i actually found that i've had the opposite problems with the city of kings it was really hard to ever reduce the description down to a very small amount of information whilst fedoran gardens is a much simpler smaller game and it's actually hard to talk about it a lot because it only <laughs> takes a few minutes to explain everything that yeah. exists you know and it's kind of maybe one day i'll do like a mid-sized game and just kind of have the luxury of it just being perfect uh, nice happy medium <laughs> yeah so speaking of the the game now being with players you, you you've also now received a lot of feedback about the game um and a lot of people have submitted reviews about it and i think it's safe to say that uh, the response to city of kings has largely been positive but you have had a couple of of negative reviews and i think um one that we mentioned previously was um tom vassal from the dice tower he 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 gave quite a negative review about the game how do you respond to to criticism like that i think it's um it's always easy, or always difficult to kind of know the right way to kind of respond to stuff but i think what's easy is to kind of be able to listen to what someone's saying and decide whether or not what they're saying is a a personal thing or kind of a generalist thing so for example um you know, someone looks at a game and they say, oh, I think that that box should be blue rather than pink, then perhaps that's a personal thing or perhaps there's kind yeah. of a generalist reason for that. And I think that when I listen to kind of the odd negative comment, like, you know, with Tom, um, a lot of the things that he says, I feel are very valid from a personal kind of perspective and from a kind of what we were trying to achieve with the game and that kind of MMO experience, I don't think that they necessarily are valid against that. But I think that from what he expected from the game, which is probably more along the lines of kind of a typical dungeon crawl, I think that it's understandable why he didn't feel that it did that. So I think that the important thing is always to listen to what they say. And if it's something that you think is a genuine kind of, this is a problem, then, you know, try and fix it or try and do something about it but when it's a very personalized 
this isn't a game offering the experience that I would like, then, you know, that's their opinion. They're welcome to have that. And there's other games for those people. And I think that all you can do is kind of, you know, acknowledge it and kind of move on. Absolutely. it's. I think it's a great point that um, in any creative sphere, um, people do tell you to, to take on board criticism and listen to feedback. But as you say not all of it is necessarily valid like if you're in a position where you're selling pizzas and then someone complains that they didn't get spaghetti yeah. you know, all you can do is say oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that way but I, I'm selling pizzas I'm not selling spaghetti yeah, and I mean, you know, a really good story that I always kind of think back to in my head, and I'm going to try and tie it into this conversation, is um, my last kind of professional kind of role, I guess, was um, user experience consultancy. So this is effectively designing kind of um, systems that are best for the user to provide the right experience. So if you go to Amazon and you want to buy a pair of socks, how can you get to that pair of socks and buy that pair of socks in the kind of the best, most enjoyable, fastest kind of route? And I was working for, um, for a contract for Honda, and we were creating a new system for Honda to kind of release worldwide in all of their kind of um, showrooms and stuff. So I was tasked with doing um, user like research. So I was in the Honda showroom, and I was talking to customers, um, testing things with them, getting feedback. And I'll always remember that I talked to loads of people. I'd gotten loads of feedback about this idea and what we were trying to do, and it was all going well. And then this one guy came along, and I said to him, "You know, are you interested? Like, would you like to talk about it?" And he was like, "Yeah, okay." And after the second question, he just completely sidetracked and started talking about lawnmowers. And <laughs> I was kind of like, "Okay," because Honda do sell lawnmowers, and yeah. um, I was like, "Okay." And he was like, "You know, which of the lawnmowers do you think are best?" and this kind of experience went from me asking his opinion on this new kind of web application to I then walked around the showroom with him and actually sold him a lawnmower. And, you know, it's just that kind of like, if, if people aren't interested in what you're doing and they, it's just not for them and they want to talk about something else or they want to have something else, then just go with the flow. You know, you never know where you're going to end up. And um, it was the weirdest thing because I had to go to the manager of the showroom and be like, this guy wants to buy this lawnmower and, you know, can someone come and take over? And <laughs> it just, it, it was so bizarre, but it was an interesting experience because in itself, it told you that that application just had no interest in that person. It was totally not what they wanted. And they yeah. were so wanting of something else that all you could really do was discuss the other thing with them. And when the conversation ended, just kind of move on. Yeah. This man is determined to get a lawnmower. Please help me, that type exactly. of thing. Yeah. Exactly, you know, and maybe they don't want an open world exploration. Maybe they want a dungeon crawl. Maybe they want something else. And, you know, that's their decision and that's kind of the person they are. Absolutely. So, Vidoran Gardens is your next game and is currently on Kickstarter. We've talked about it a little bit, but do you want to briefly tell us what it's about? Because we at Unlucky Frog Studios have not had the pleasure of playing it yet. So, Fedoran Gardens is a um, completely standalone game in the City of Kings universe, and you take on the role of kind of Vidoran acolytes who are exploring through this garden, performing tasks. So you're going to have a hand of cards, and these cards are going to have different squares of different um, terrains, so there's grass areas, water areas, soil areas, and as you play through the game, you're going to take it in turns to place a card in front of you, and each card you place will have to overlap the last card you played, and they kind of go left to right so you kind of um, create this long path in front of you and you're trying to join up different areas so you'll have achievements that will say you know try and have four grass areas that contain different animals all connected to each other or try and have um, different types of water areas connected so you're taking it in turns to kind of take cards from this middle pool so you're drafting cards and placing them in front of you to kind of form this path. And it's really um, a card drafting, card placement, um, along the lines of things like King Domino or Honshu. Okay. Um, but it's a slightly more kind of game game. So it's got a lot more kind of thinking and kind of, um, you can always see what's going to happen in the next round and the future rounds after that. So you're kind of 
have lots of foresight and planning and kind of making a decision about this is what I want to do now this is what I want to do next but then maybe something happens that's going to change what you're going to want to do and you kind of have to keep adapting to kind of the situations that arise sounds like an interesting little game and look forward to seeing more of it in the future and maybe even getting to sit down to play it so Vidoran Gardens is currently on Kickstarter uh, along with the second print run of the City of Kings is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So we've got um, a selection of kind of, you know, content um, enhancements, so expansions for the City of Kings. Um, so the current Kickstarter is Fedoran Gardens and the expansions for the City of Kings, but then the reprint options kind of available for those who didn't pick it up the first time as well. There we go. And very briefly, before we have to finish up, what does the future for the City of Games look like? <laughs> it's 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 ever changing so when you know we spoke what, a few days ago when we did the first recording i think even since then um the plans have changed and kind of <laughs> evolved so you know this yeah. is fresh it's completely new and original so brace yourself but um for me really it's about continuing to make games within the city of kings universe but what those games are is just going to be kind of a natural evolution so we've been um working on a game called Rising Blades, which is a competitive game where you're kind of the bad side of the kind of the world, and it's kind of about you going out and destroying the world. Um, we've been working on lots of kind of little social games and party games, which are kind of in the City of Kings universe and more small games like Fedora and Gardens. But we've also recently started working on kind of another big game, which is set about 100 years kind of after the City of Kings kind of in the future. And um, that's another kind of cooperative game, which um, I'm not going to say too much about, but it's kind of another interesting kind of take on our world, kind of telling more of the overall story. And I think that for us, we're going to just keep working on all these different games and whichever ones kind of come together quickest will be the ones we probably will put out next. Well, I have to say what we've played of the City of Kings so far and Lucky Frog, we've thoroughly enjoyed. So I think it's safe to say we're very much looking forward to, to seeing whatever the future brings for the City of Kings and the City of Games, whatever that may be. No, I really appreciate that. And um, we will be at UK Games Expo and Gen Con this year, which will have all of our kind of games, any new stuff that we have with us at the time as well. So hopefully you and anyone else who's listening will be able to come to one of those two events and get a chance to play some of the games. Absolutely. There you go. If you are at the con any of those big conventions this convention season, keep an eye out for the City of Games. But unfortunately, that is all we've got time for. Um, but before we go, Frank, if anyone is interested in the City of Games, uh, Vidoran Gardens, City of Kings, and just generally what you guys are up to, where should they go? So the easiest way to find us is to go to our website, which is thecityofkings.com. Um, on there, you'll find our Facebook and Twitter pages. You'll find a link to the Kickstarter. Um, on most social platforms, we're City of Games HQ. So you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter using City of Games HQ. But they're all linked to from the website. And if somebody wants to snag a copy of The Door and Gardens or City of Kings, where can they go for that? So at the moment, the best option is through the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter is running until May 17th. And then once um, the Kickstarter is finished, we'll be opening the pledge manager and we'll have the option for people to kind of join into that if they miss the Kickstarter as well. Um, and that will probably run through until about the end of June. So for the next kind of like six weeks, that will be the best places to get them. There you have it, folks. Right. Frank, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. No worries. Thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And for all of our listeners, wherever you are, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. We are Unlucky Frog Gaming, and I am Ben. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for Unlucky Frog Gaming. You can also show your support by giving us money through the Unlucky Frog Patreon. And be sure to check out our website unluckyfrog.com to find out more. Mm -hmm.